Hello and welcome to our short reflection on a series of three readings uh, from the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Let's get straight in and read, first of all, from John's Gospel. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table. Mary took a pound of costly perfume, made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii, and the money given to the poor? And he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She brought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. What was Jesus doing on his last week? What took his interest, captured his attention? Uh, what does he point to or exalt? Mark tells us in Mark chapter 12, 41 to 43, that before the Bethany meal uh, that we read, Jesus went to the temple and sat watching. He sat by the collection box. Jesus was interested in the people giving free will offerings to the temple, to his father's house, the house of prayer for all nations. It's helpful to remember the Jewish practice at this time uh, had two aspects to it, the home and the temple. Food and worship. Women were important in the former and men perhaps more in the latter. Jesus spent most time in the home setting. Let's not forget, Jesus himself is the temple. A few days before Passover and his passion and Jesus is watching, waiting for something special to happen. I believe he was watching for the widow. The first woman of our tale, a widow, a poor woman, who drops in a few coppers. Most people would not bend down to pick them up if they fell to the ground. Jesus stands up and says, she has given more than anyone. It looks like Jesus was guided by the Holy Spirit to sit there in order to draw our attention in the last week of his life on earth to the generosity of a poor woman. She gave everything she had. I don't think the story ends there. I believe this woman might have changed the course of church history. But I'll come back to that on the third reflection. Giving may not be our priority, but it was his priority. Mark often puts two stories together uh, with another, with an interlude in between, a dramatic contrast. But we aren't keyed in to notice this. It's, it's often a bit lost on us. Mark spends the next chapter relating how Jesus answered his disciples' questions about the temple. That is what they were interested in. The big stones of the great building. Jesus just said, it's all coming down. He was interested in a poor widow. When I was writing this last week, I, I wondered if that widow missed Jesus. I don't know, but he did not miss her. She caught his attention. Now, I'm not sure about this, but possibly if we're looking in 
completely the wrong direction. But with a heart for God, he will surely find us. I think that might just be so. Jesus ends his discussion about the temple by warning them to keep awake so the disciples were woke after all. I'm sorry about that joke. The next chapter looks like it might be the same event that John talks about. It's a meal and Bethany and an anointing. It might be that this happened many times. Or it might be that Lazarus had another name and was also called Simon. I, I don't know. Just before we launch into Martha's supper, notice Lazarus is completely silent again. He's just out to lunch. Martha is serving. Now, some scholars suggest a Eucharistic overtone might be intended by this whole event. That's a quote from the clever folk. Martha is unusually described as diaconio, to serve. She was the deacon, not Lazarus. By the time John had written his gospel, the term deacon was an office of ministry in the church. Martha might have found the better part this time. Take note of that for our readings tomorrow. Mary breaks in and makes an unbelievably extravagant and expensive gesture. A year's salary gone, the work of but a moment. The house was filled with the fragrance. A year's salary for a labourer, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, £10 an hour, that's £21,840, nearly £22,000 gone in a moment. Judas went eight. He had a fit. What about the poor? Not because he cared about the poor. He was a thief. We'll come back to him on uh, the last reflection. Many years ago, I had a book by Malcolm Muggeridge about Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Uh, Malcolm had taken a, a gift out to the Sisters of Charity. And uh, uh, Teresa uh, took the gift and said, let's do something beautiful for Jesus. When Matthew and Mark tell a similar story to this one in John about the anointing, they record Jesus saying, she has performed a beautiful or good service for me. In Greek, the word beautiful and good are the same. So it's about the context. Often you might find modern translations saying this is a good thing she's done for me. But it, the word is beautiful. They thought if the thing was beautiful outside, it was beautiful all the way through. I mean, we don't tend to think that. But that's why they've got one word for both things. I like that idea that she has done a beautiful service. For me. Scholars suggest that Mary is performing a prophetic act. She is preparing him for burial. You do not always have me with you. They didn't get this. They thought they were with him forever, that he would soon be gone, but he would soon be gone, and their opportunity with it. How many regrets there would be. Jesus valued the almost worthless gift and the extravagant wealthy gift. Should the poor give? Should the rich waste? This was a one-time only opportunity. I'm not here long. Jesus does not demand our insignificant, almost valueless everything nor our precious anything. But when we give, he pays attention. Jesus said that everywhere the gospel is told, that story will be told about this woman. Which is why I'm telling you the story. The woman who anointed Jesus with precious perfume became part of the gospel story. Now in our parishes, in our ministry areas, in our churches, let us do something beautiful for Jesus. It begins with a gift. When I was sharing some of these thoughts this week, I actually began and wanted to end this 
part with a quotation from the other John, maybe the same John, but the one that wrote Revelation. And I was reading this as I was preparing and it so struck me as Jesus suddenly appears so different, so magnificent. And these words are in the beginning of John's Revelation and I, I was reading them as if I'd never read them before. And I think as we look at these reflections of Jesus of the last few days of his life on earth, let's keep the end in mind. Let's keep where Jesus was going. Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over kings of the earth, to him be who loved us and released us from our sins by his own blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever.